get started. Um, so uh, just to kind of briefly or do a, a brief introduction, um, it came up recently in um, like someone asked me a question. And so I wanted to um, address it because um, uh, I think uh, I might have just glossed over it. And so maybe it'd be a good note to reiterate. Um, but uh, some quick tools or like the someone asked like what what are the, like the basic tools to do the kind of thing that we're talking about like basically creating web um web programs or web applications um like what are some of the um sort of essential tools required um to do this sort of thing and so i just wanted to uh like uh, maybe present some of those really quick um for documentation because uh it's much simpler than you might think, and uh, it's pretty quick. So first, uh, I wanted to cover that. And then um, following that, um, kind of going to do a rehearsed review of the sort of web technologies that we've been talking about and the one we're focusing. And then we're going to get into a specific um, set of um, uh, points about um, CSS today that we haven't covered yet, which is the um, basics of the box model and understanding um, borders, margins, padding, um, and then get a little bit into like um, um, composite uh, attributes. So that's just an overview, a general overview of what's going on. So I'm going to get into editors first, um, getting back to the sort of basic tools that you need to do what I'm showing you to create code that produces something like this, like a web page. So I want to cover a couple of those because it was asked recently. And I do think it's like, uh, maybe not clear at first, like, wait, how do I like do this on my own? Like, do I need a website? Like, do I need to go, you know, buy a web domain and like set up a server and then host the code there so that people can, and, and the answer is you don't need any of that to start making websites. So it's, it's different to try to make a web page or a website versus trying to um, potentially uh, host it and make it accessible to the public. Um, so one of the first things you're gonna need is a, a text editor. Um, and I pulled up a couple of tabs here, just showing some, you know, going from like a pretty, what I would consider like a basic code editor. I'm leaving, I'm kind of omitting, omitting some um, like a very, core like very simple text editors because you kind of want more than that if you're learning how to code um so something like on windows like you might have encountered notepad on mac i think it's um called text edit um this is like these are like really really simple text editors that do get the job done but to start working with code you'll really want something a little more as it says here sophisticated um, but nothing too complex is required. So this is where you would do something like write your code. You'll organize files as you see on the left here with this folder tree. Um, and it'll include a lot of utilities to let you like work within your uh, directory structure that you've built. So you can see them jumping around here to different lines of code in the project um they've got their yeah like i said the directory tree on the left here with different projects and you also note something um that makes code editing unique which is like it has sort of like file recognition you see how all of these um all of these like edits and uh lines of code are like highlighted with particular colors and that's what a code editor is really going to let you do um whereas a text editor is really just kind of like a, a window into like any kind of text. It's not trying to do what's called like markup or um, syntax highlighting um, depending on the file type. That's what a code editor will do. So if you open a .c file, you'll actually see that um, it will uh, highlight um, with color coding the, um, the syntax or like the words in the file depending on the language that you're using. So um this is pretty useful um so this is like a pretty base base example of a code text editor is this an um, alternative to using the terminal 
Um, that's a, that's a good question. So, and I can clarify that quickly. So, um, let me actually share um, just my whole desktop really quick. Um, so you should be able to see that. So I want to pop open this. Let me open a new window. Those are my notes. So this we talked about in a session beforehand, and I'll just quickly uh, like highlight it again. This is a terminal. This is an application that's available on like pretty much any operating system for uh, like a like a desktop or like a laptop computer, and it has a bunch of associated utility utilities that it's letting you access. Um, so this, what this is letting you do is just enter commands like this. Like I can say, here's a command, it's ls. Here's a command, it's cd. And I'm saying cd um, up uh, two uh, directories, or I'm sorry, up one directory. So you can see if I ls again, it's showing me the contents of this directory. These are two folders. Um, so that's that's what a terminal lets you do. It's just an application lets you use the command line, and the command line will change depending on your operating system. Um, what an editor, an editor is like a specific utility that I can access within my terminal, um, but I can also access it via the user interface that we're all familiar with. Like in this case, you know, I'm using the user interface to access my directory. So here is my like directory my local directory and you can see also like i can go here i can go to downloads and i'm accessing the directory downloads via my user interface but if i go to the terminal i can also do that i can say cd i can use this keyword which is this tilde it just means like my home directory you can say downloads and if i ls you'll see a lot of the files in fact every file that you just saw using this um, user interface so it's just two approaches to doing the same thing. One is using command line utilities accessible via the terminal. And the other is using the graphical user interface. So through the terminal, I can access all kinds of different utilities. One of them is uh, like, uh, or one of them being like an editor. I can access all kinds of different editors. Some editors are designed specifically to be used within the terminal. Um, so for example, uh, Vim is one. It's a really popular one. I like to use it. Um, it is. It has like a kind of a barrier to entry, which is um, it uses hotkeys to navigate. Um, that is typically considered kind of not user friendly. But I can show you here. You know, I can add some text. We can go to next lines. We can even do things like selections, block selections. I can copy this selection. Can jump down to a new line. And I can paste that selection. Um, you'll see it pasted all of the space too, the white space. So this is an editor option. Um, right now, to navigate this, like move this cursor, I'm actually using uh, particular the home, what are called the home keys on the keyboard. If you if you remember that from like grade school, like learning in keyboard class. So I'm using J to go down, K to go up. Um, this is like an editor kind of meant for like very fast work um, where you get accustomed to the keyboard shortcuts and it lets you get um, very uh, quick results, quick editing results. You can do things, big changes very quickly. Um, it also has syntax highlighting. I can, I can kind of demonstrate that. So it, it's really not any huge uh, gain. Uh, if you're, especially if you're just starting, then something like what I was showing here with Sublime Text, um, or another example I wanted to show, which is CUDA Text. Um, uh, there's more heavy, heavyweight editors like Visual Studio Code. Um, Atom is another editor for code, um, or even something like um, you know Text Edit, which is for OS X specifically, but there's also Notepad++, um, you know, there, there's a bunch of these. And really, um, the goal is to um, let you write code easily. So to answer the terminal question, like there are editors that are designed specifically for the terminal. And if you wanted to read about one, the word I mentioned was Vim editor. And you can read about that. There's others called, um, there's one called uh, Emacs. That's an editor, that's a terminal um console program 
But Sublime Text and the terminal are not interchangeable. No, not at all. Yeah, Sublime Text is an application. Um, it's a unique application, and its function is as a code editor. The terminal is uh, a unique application um, that allows you to like run other applications, um, but just via a command as opposed to clicking on the application. So. Uh kind of, I think the best way for me to illustrate that actually is to maybe show you an example of using, so here we go, for example, I can say, I, I can say Firefox in here, or maybe I can say, um, I'm trying to think of a good, oh, I got it. Sometimes to run an application from the terminal, you have to add it to uh, what's called your path, which is just says like the terminal needs to be aware of the application that you're trying to run before you try to run it. So even though I have Audacity installed here, I actually have to go to where it's uh, installed on my machine in order to figure out, um, in order to run it. But I think it's a good exercise. So we'll just go there in the UI, for example, first. And you can see here, I have like this application, Milky Trek, well, we won't do that. Maybe, maybe we'll do Audacity. I think maybe people have heard of that one. Um, so we can take this directory. Now I can do this in OSX, um, though that's not necessarily super common. And I can just say, um, I can drag the little folder like that into the terminal, but really I'm just, it's just a shortcut or spelling out the name of the directory that I want to go to. So I can say CD applications, and it's going to take me to applications. And um, it's going to take me to um, this directory, which in the terminal, uh, listing the contents of the directory looks like this. But in the UI, it looks like this, which is like a lot more friendly sort of uh, way of looking at things. Um, so I can pick one of these, and I've never really run uh, like a OSX application um, usually like this. I usually map them to my path. And you know, for me personally, I don't really need to be able to access any of these via the terminal. Um, so let's try to do like, oh yeah, there we go. So let's see what it does. No, it doesn't like it as a command. I think maybe we can try this. No. Oh, it's a directory. Okay, let's say Steam. So to get into a directory, you would say CD. So we'll go in here. Let's see if we can run it. We can say maybe resources. This might be a failed effort. I actually don't know if I can just sort of execute it like you would, um, let's say like Vim. So see Vim is like on my path as a command that I can execute, which starts the Vim application. Um, so you can see it says Vim now, and like using that application. Um, but it looks like Steam isn't set up on my path like that. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's like a good example of one that is, maybe calculator. Nope, it doesn't like it. I'll try one more, but the point is that you can run applications with, that's not too useful. You can run applications with the terminal just like you run applications with the, um, the mouse um, and clicking an application like you would here. Okay. But um, yeah, I don't have these particular applications set up on my path. So I'm, in a terminal, I'm more inclined to do things that are terminal specific um, because obviously we have this nice GUI that we can use. So um, most people don't navigate around their computer using a terminal, um, but you can certainly navigate around directories very quickly uh, using a terminal. Um, so that's something I wanted to illustrate. But yeah, it's it's very different from an editor. It's not a um, not um, an editor, but rather it's more of like um, something that could let us run an editor. Um, whereas an editor is only going to be able to do just that, which is edit code files or edit text files. Um, here's a really simple example. 
it's like the default editor for OSX and it's super simple. I can put text in here. In fact, it's set up more for like plain text, like just like maybe you, I don't know, write up an email or like a Word document or something. Um, so I personally, yeah, like I said, use Vim, but I just wanted to show um, some of these. This is one that I like a lot. I've used it before. It's cross-platform. So if you use Windows, you can use it. Uh, I think if you use Linux, you can use it as well. Um, CUDA text is one that is more oriented for performance. So it's lightweight, but also very uh, fast. Um, and it's also cross-platform, so you can use it on different operating systems. Um, Atom is really cool because it's highly configurable. It's also open source, so is CUDA text. And Visual Studio Code is a Microsoft editor that um, lets you um, edit and actually build and um, sort of like set up uh, complex like backend code projects. Um, so it's not just it kind of crosses the border between like editor and like uh, what we call like a development environment. Um, so I don't want to spend too much more time on that. But if, if you have additional questions, like which one should I choose? And like, for what reasons, maybe I can answer those like, after the fact, if you want to stick around. Um, the so that kind of addresses the primary tool that you need, um, which is a text editor. Um, the secondary tool that you need to edit web code is just a browser. Now you might think, um, okay, well that kind of takes me back to square one because what do I use the browser for? I use the browser to go to web pages on the internet. So um, if my code isn't on the internet, then how do I like modify it and change it? Um, well, the example I wanted to show here is if you look at this URL, this URL isn't actually pointing to the um, the um, like the the internet, like a URL on the internet. It's actually pointing to a file on my computer. Um, so the way I did that is um, can again use our handy GUI and do this, but um, we can also do this um, just by typing it in. But um, you can do this on any computer. You can do this on Windows, you know, Linux, OS X. Any browser is capable of pointing to a file on your local machine. And this is a very, very useful tool. The way to do that in OS X really easily is just literally drop it. It's not a good example there because um, it's already there. But you can see I'm kind of like dropping it as a new tab. It'll go to the new tab and open it right up. And we can navigate around. It works completely. As long as you don't have anything dependent on like internet, like URL resources, um, that is if you're not connected to the internet. But even if you have like, you're trying to build network requests and stuff like test those, those will totally work too, as long as you're connected to the internet. But um, yeah, basically just wanted to point out that your web page doesn't have to be hosted for you to work on it. It doesn't have to be at an actual URL like, like I have set up. Um, you, you can just do this all locally. So code, like text editor and web browser, Chrome, Firefox, I'm using Firefox, um, Internet Explorer. You know, these are all editors probably, or uh, browsers we're probably pretty familiar with. So those are like the two minimum things that you kind of need to uh, kind of write, yeah, write code and uh, see it work. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, I guess with that being said, um, let's kind of migrate to, or let's try to migrate to, and I'll, I'll put up a, I'll put up links to a couple of these on my resources page, um, probably under here that you can look at some examples. Um, but if anyone doesn't have any questions, I'll go ahead and migrate us to the next part. I think we can migrate. Okay, cool. So um, let me change my share. So today specifically, I wanted to talk about um, uh, some CSS concepts 
that are a little more like intermediate. Um, these in particular um, are useful for um, designing like, or they're necessary concepts for designing like clean and organized sort of web pages, but they're also necessary for understanding like when you write some code, um, some like you build out some HTML and you add some accompanying CSS, like why do certain elements end up where they end up on the page? And we'll find some things that are probably like maybe not super intuitive immediately. And then it's kind of an intuition that you build over time. But um, to access or like to kind of view the concepts that I'm talking about, uh, we're gonna use this inspector tool. I've introduced it a couple times. And um, the way to get to it, you know, you right click, um, you right click on the page, uh, you click inspect element, it's gonna bring up your inspector tool. This is in the browser. And um, what we're gonna be looking at specifically is we're gonna be looking at this layout tab in Chrome. It might be a little bit different um, if you can't find it. Um, excuse me, let me know and we can find the analogous. Um, but um, yeah, it should be that you can inspect a particular element in here. You're going to want to choose the selector tool here, which in Chrome might be placed a little bit differently, but should look the same. And you can kind of walk around the uh, page as it's rendered. You'll see that the inspector box will like, uh, it's going to like show you the corresponding HTML um, for that particular element. And then if you actually select, take, take note of this layout um, tab over here. If you actually select one of these elements, this will change, um, the layout will change. Um, should change. Or if I actually have a different layout um, for a particular element, it will change. Yeah, so you'll see the numbers updating here. So if I Try to get you a better, more clear example. These are all, I don't have a particular width, um, which uh, you'll see in a second, like the, CS rule, the CSS rules that would be like required or the attributes that you'd need to kind of change um, these dimensions that are listed here. But um, you can kind of see that popping up for particular elements. This one is a good clear example. So if I click this, um, the width says right here, it's 1344, that's pixels by 18.2. Um, and then if I select just this one, you'll see a change. So now we have 45.9167 by 15. Um, so this is what's called a containing box. Um, and then this is um, the box that contains that box. So the long story short of that is like every element on the web page um, is going to be represented as a box. Um, it may not always look like a box. Um, like these look pretty free form. They look like free floating. Uh, there's no like, you know, no clear box like this, but you can see that when we inspect it and hover, we're actually getting these boxes, these containing boxes. And um, that's kind of the way that everything is uh, rendered on a page. Um, uh, when, when the browser loads your document, it's going to put everything in these boxes. And the way that we specify the size and sort of um, the layout of these boxes on the page is using CSS. All right. So hopefully the inspector part of that is kind of clear. I want to pull up this documentation um, here. Um, this is going to be a pretty useful resource for understanding the containing block, like what constitutes the containing block. It's kind of clearly um, kind of laid out here. We have the content area. So what it's referring to there is like in this example, um, if we look here, the content of this containing block is the text itself. So this text here is the, like the, the content. And then we have the padding, um, you know, which, which is kind of laying out here each individual item, the border, and then the margin. So to kind of sum it all up, 
Um, the padding is um, like, as you can see, the space between the, the border of our, um, uh, of our containing block and the content. Um, if we change or modify the padding, which I'll actually give an example of doing right now, if we modify the padding, what it's going to do is change the size of our containing block, um, uh, d depending on the kind of uh, change that I do to that padding. Now, this layout tool in the inspector will actually let you do that um, like very immediately, which is pretty cool. So I can actually just experiment really quickly with different paddings, and you'll notice the change is like very immediate. You'll also notice that padding um, has a couple of different effects um, in the rendered content of the page. First of all, the padding is um, going to shift. Like if I put padding on the left of the um, the left of the uh, the left side of like our containing block, it's going to shift the content this part uh, to the right. So you can see as it's a uh, like specified, the padding is the difference between the border or the space between the border and the content itself. So if I change that padding, it's only going to change the amount of pat, like the amount of space taken up by this particular section, and it's going to grow it into the content um, area. Like it's going to take up more space um, uh, towards the content section. So that's why there is this differentiation between padding and margin, because um, these do kind of look like the same concept. It's almost like we have this border like moat in between this padding region and the margin region. Um, that's why there is this differentiation, because it sort of comes up, um, it comes up as um, uh, having different symptoms for the box depending on your layout. And uh, it may seem a little bit confusing right now, but I just want to kind of get it out there because uh, once you are at least introduced to the concepts, you know like what to check on if this comes up for you in unexpected ways. So um, if I wanted to not modify the content of this box, um, like where the content is positioned within the box, that might be a good way of putting it. As you can see, if I select the box, you'll see that my content, let me hover it again. This is maybe a bad box because the text is really hard to see. Um, so let's modify this one instead. I'm gonna undo the padding change on this box. And also, I'm actually gonna avoid using this because uh, I want to show you the CSS uh, that's required to make this change. But I do think it's really useful for experimentation. And um, you can actually just shorthand that PX that I'm using is pixels. Um, so this is just a shorthand. I don't have to specify pixels. Um, but that, that is what that means, that PX. So sorry, I kind of glossed over that. But you'll notice um, in this left hand box here, it's actually adding rules for us as we make these adjustments. These are like quick rules that it's putting in for us um, that represent these changes like in CSS terms. So what it's doing is it's quickly adding a CSS rule. It's a, it's a, um, like a term, uh, like a, uh, what's it called, a keyword that represents the left-hand side, the padding for the left-hand side of the, the containing block. Um, so as you can imagine, and you might have caught it earlier, so you'll know the answer to this ahead of time, but if I wanted to, maybe someone can chime in, maybe Austin, if you um, picked up on this, like if I wanted to change the right side, um, you can probably guess what keyword I would use in terms of CSS. Padding right? Yes, that is right. Yeah, it's pretty, gets pretty much just as intuitive as that. Um, nothing Could you too go back to the, you had something open where it showed like margin. Uh, oh, yeah, sure, sure. 
So yeah, the, the margin that uh, the dotted line delineates what is uh, visualized on the screen, or the margin is in between the border and the screen dimensions. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, I, um, we can let's go ahead and move to margin because it's, I think border. Let me quickly address border because I think it's like. Um, and actually, this is a terrible page to use because it's so simple. The layout isn't going to give us very much to work with. So I'm going to use my sample page that I made with some crazy layout going on so we can really see this stuff in effect. Because um, I already have some things here with some borders. So let's play with this. I made this like crazy containing block that I want to show to demonstrate some of these concepts. Um, let's inspect this. This is a, um, it's an image element. Okay, so got this keyword IMG here. This means that it's basically just a special HTML element that allows me to embed an image. Um, I've done a couple of things to embed this. So I'll kind of cover that really quickly before we get into the border. So one thing I want to differentiate first is uh, for the containing block, it's kind of complicated. I mean, we can just compare, actually really quick, I'll open both so we can kind of compare those two because they're quite different. So I'll inspect it again and I'm focusing the image element here. Okay, look at the layout for this. It's like got a lot going on. It's much different compared to um, what we had on this page when we examined like an element like, let's do, I think this one will be the easiest to observe. When we examined this one, I mean, there's this margin here, um, which is specified um, and there's uh, no left or right hand margin. There's no padding, there's no border. All we have is the content of the box. Um, or sorry, all we have is the content itself, which is doing what's called like filling, um, filling to the like allowed width. Um, so it's a pretty simple containing block. Um, and you'll notice another attribute of it because the width is um, you know, kind of prove why that width is like automatic and how the content is actually just filling to whatever width is allowed, this 1384. Um, if I shrink this, you'll notice, or I don't know, can you see me shrinking it? Is that happening for you? I don't know. Can you, okay. where should it, where should it be? What should it be? <laughs> yeah, let me, uh, I mean, sometimes I have to share the desktop um, to kind of demonstrate that kind of thing. Okay, but you should see it now. I have this like kind of browser is windowed. Yeah. So I'm sh changing the size of the browser, but you'll notice uh -huh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the oh, content. No, see, yeah, so the dimensions are changing. I see now, yeah. Yes, yeah. So you can see that I changed the width of the browser window. Okay, but this content width stays the same. The content width does not change with the um, width of the browser. And you'll see here, like Dawson just said, the dimensions themselves of this containing block, they do change and they adapt with the browser. But the content itself, um, the content like that we observe is not actually changing. And I want to say that it won't change until yeah. yeah we get to the uh, um, age, yeah. really squeeze it down yeah so then it will update and that's because the content itself um like our text it doesn't actually require like that full width so it's just going to occupy what it needs to occupy until we really force it to to go down and then you'll see it's actually um it's just changing the um the width of that box um, so actually, another cool thing to see would be selecting one of these boxes. What is like the first thing maybe you notice about um, these dimensions 
um, since I selected this um, box as opposed to this one. Can you say that again? Yeah, so what, what's the biggest change in dimension that you've noticed um, as a difference between this block and this containing block? Uh, I guess it's wider or taller, rather. Yeah, yeah. If you notice um, here, so the, the width is act, it's not too different um, in terms of, I guess, like magnitude. You know, we're up, we're up in like near 300, the high 300s or whatever. Um, and that's part in part because I have this uh, space happening over here. Um, this unordered list element is saying that I have a 40 pixel um, padding. Um, so the individual elements that make up the unordered list, these list items, they're automatically going to be forced to occupy like a lesser width um, because of that. But, but this one doesn't. So that explains the change in width. But the change in height is pretty interesting because it's a what I would call like, um, it's an automatic feature of the browser. So the browser had to make a decision, like the people making, or I guess the people that made the browser, they had to make a decision, like what happens when you shrink, you know, like what happens when you shrink this width like this? What should we do like with our content? Um, there are actually ways within CSS for me to say that this shouldn't happen. I can actually give, items uh, a specified width, okay? So if I actually, I can test that now, and I think it should work. Um, so I can say this should stay 703, okay? And you'll note here, this now added a width attribute or a width rule to my CSS. It's saying, I'm saying the width needs to be 703 pixels. If I do start to decrease this, yeah, what, what do you see immediately that is different uh, compared to what was happening previously when I squeezed this page? Well, the dimension is not changing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I can um, override some of the default behaviors um, that are expected uh, when I change the dimensions of my browser with these rules. Um, but uh, otherwise, what will happen is the browser has to have this like embedded default response to um, like for the sake of the user in order to accommodate different like screen sizes and different dimensions. So one of those default behaviors that I'll like I'm just introducing with this is that um, text by default uh, moves uh, by like a line break. Um, we actually have a rule um, that is um, uh, modifying like the um, the, uh, the default like attributes of a line and that's this uh, line height here. Um, what this is saying is that for any list item, um, that's what this li is, this selector, saying that any item in this list here is gonna have a line height of 1.3, EM, um, an EM is just a different uh, way of specifying um, like a measurement uh, on a web page um, compared with like pixels. Now uh, I can demonstrate that pretty easily um, by just changing that metric here and using pixels instead. So you'll notice things are really squished together. That's because I've said that um, basically a line on a page is actually smaller uh, in height than my font that I've chosen. So uh, my font family is Helvetica. Um, this font family in particular has uh, certain properties that say like it should take up this much pixel space, but I've now made my line uh, shorter than that. So that's why this is all like bleeding over and it looks absolutely terrible. Um, I can change that back using EM. And what EM is, um, actually didn't originally make a note to, did I? Maybe I did, but that's okay. Um, I'll leave 
a link to it because it's kind of interesting um, to read about. But it's uh, uh, oops. we're going to say, let's go for this. I think this will, yeah, here we go. So this is a good example of a lot of the different ways of specifying uh, like these metrics for measurement um, or um, size or length. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them individually, like the different ways to do it, but um, there are a bunch of different ones. And what EM lets us do is it basically lets us um, specify uh, based on um, like a, a relative measurement of the element um, that uh, we're contained by. So um, that may be a little confusing, but let me use this box to kind of illustrate that. So if I use EM to specify the, like the width of this content or the padding or the margin or the border, what that means is it's going to um, scale the measurement that I just specified um, relative to the box that surrounds this one. Um, and it's like, that'll keep going further and further out. So here, oops, in this example, um, I have line height as 1.13 EM for um, the any list item. So if I were to change um, let's say, let's say I added a rule. So I'm going to add a CSS rule here. Okay, let's say, um, or let's do it actually in the um, included file. Um, so you can get to any included CSS by um, going to the style editor tab in different browsers. It might be different things like just style or something like that, but, um, oh, it actually included our, huh, our other uh, fake element here. So I'm gonna delete this one. Let's see, and I think you can just maybe, you delete it. And you can go to changes, delete there. I don't know. I guess you can't delete it. That's kind of annoying in this window, um, but, Maybe if I find a way to do it later, I'll introduce that. Um, let's just go back to the style editor. So if you were thinking, if you were wondering where these rules were coming from, I just wanted to demonstrate this tab here because it kind of is a really concise representation of all of them. The only rules that are applying to this particular web page are uh, body rule, uh, list item rule, and a list item dot web resources rule. These are just different selectors that are letting me uh, indicate different elements on the page. Um, the line item elements are, or I'm sorry, the list item elements are these, the one we were messing with before with the width change. Um, that's one of those. And in particular, as you might have guessed, since I have a only one rule specifying color here, and that color lines up with. Um, whoops, this particular color is a uh, light green. Um, so you can imagine that when I say list item dot web resources, I'm referring to these web resources here. And uh, just to be super clear on that, the way I did that is I added this class. So I have this class web resources. That's how I'm able to like assign that rule as a blanket to all of these list items. Now, what I wanted to do really quickly is just show that, let's say I added another rule for all unordered lists, which contain list items. Okay, so I can do it here, just edit the code immediately. And let's say that we set the line height in pixels, and we'll say 2px. Um, or we'll say maybe like 50 px or something. Um, 
Well, it's not gonna like it, but that's also a cool example because it should tell us why it doesn't like it. That should be saying line height. Oh, right, that we don't want to do line height. So because this unordered list doesn't occupy a single line, um, you can see that uh, it did uh, take my change, but it kind of affected it in a weird way um, or in a way that I didn't expect. So I'm not going to get into particulars of that effect, but let's just do something that does work. So we changed the font size here to be something pretty dramatic. Let's scale that back a little bit, something like or something where it's kind of obvious. Okay, so what we did here is we changed the font size to like um, an explicit um, setting to be uh, 20 pixels. And that should come up in our style editor too, yeah. Um, so we can see the change here. Um, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to modify the, the font size for individual list items as well. And I'm first gonna use a, um, this explicit specifier of pixels. When I say pixels, I'm saying like literally the number of pixels on the screen that are um, occupied by like, in this case, my font. So it means that 20 pixels, this font is like 20 pixels in height on my screen right now. Um, so if I, and, and that means for, for all of the items within an unordered list. Now, if I say here, if I say for any list item, I'll say 20 pixels, you'll notice there's no change because I'm basically anything within this unordered list, which would include list items, they'll also have this 20 pixel font size. Um, but if I use one of the relative rules that I introduced a second ago, like the, um, the, uh, the EM specifier, um, then I'll get a different result. Okay, so you can see that one was pretty dramatic. Um, let's try 1EM. So 1EM looks exactly the same. So you'll see that non-list items, they have the same font size as these other list items do. Um, that's because this 1EM, what it's saying is give me a font size that is one times the element that is containing me. So list items are contained by these uh, unordered lists. So like each of these is a list item within an unordered list. And I'm saying for all unordered lists, give me a font size of 20. Um, within those, I'm saying use a font size that is one times that. So if I change this to two, things got a bit bigger overall. Um, but you'll notice that this is still um, just the default font size. And that's because it's not an unordered list or a list item. But everything else got a lot bigger. Um, and that's because I've laid out this page to have be like a bunch of unordered lists. Um, I don't know if that's super helpful or like maybe a bit confusing right now, but I'm really just trying to introduce that um, like everything that you're doing in CSS is basically modifying a bunch of boxes. You're modifying the, in particular, the layout um, here of a bunch of boxes. Um, so when I make these font size modifications, I'm modifying a box um, in oftentimes in an indirect way. So if you notice before, if we refresh the page, you'll see that the height here is, this is now 52 pixels. Um, the width is still the same. Maybe you remember the value, the 1344. If I refresh the page, I go back. The height is now 18.2 pixels. So that is a direct result of our font change that we did. And when we refresh the page, we lost our font change. So that rule that we added for the unordered list is no longer there. Um, I know I probably jumped like all over the place. 
Uh, I know sometimes that can be a little confusing, um, but I really just wanted to demonstrate that one concept that everything is a box. Um, in CSS, you can give the box properties like um, width, say 20px. We just changed every list item to have a width of 20px. Then do height, 10px. We just made all the boxes really, really small. Um, and you know, we, we could keep going down the list. Um, let's say margin left, we can do something really crazy. We can make all of the margins really big on the left side for all those boxes. Maybe I should have just done this before because I think it's a little bit more obvious what's happening. And we can undo all of these and uh, we're kind of taking for granted also how cool the browser is that it lets you kind of do this stuff in real time, which I think is super useful for learning. And that's one of the best ways to do it. Um, so it's going to re-render all of this stuff as we add our CSS rules, which is super cool. Um, we do have only like two minutes left. I know I threw like a lot of information at you um, um, in, at everyone in the room right now. So, um, you know, uh, feel free to like um, ask me questions if you want any clarification or anything like that. But I don't want to make anyone uh, feel like they got to stick around. So I just wanted to be clear, like, feel free to, to dip um, if you do have to go. But uh, yeah, does anyone have any like, like immediate questions maybe that I can wrap up in a couple minutes or something? Um, this has been really great information. Yeah, I think it's like kind of, I know it's, it's kind of hard to present in some ways because um, it's hard to make very atomic changes, like uh, small changes to elements without explaining how a change to one element will affect others. Um, and so I might next time maybe try to present a better breakdown of a bunch of different examples of like isolated elements. Um, and maybe I should have come back to this, but um, I do, yeah, hope that it's at least that fact is now clear when maybe it, if maybe it wasn't before, like if you modify an element, the width of an element, it will affect all the rest of your page too in maybe unexpected ways. So that's something that you'll want to experiment with if you're building your own page. Yeah, there's so much that you can do just with CSS and it's really quite great. Yeah. And the, the, also the fact that it's, it's so immediate, you make a change and then you can see that change is super helpful as well. Yeah. Yeah. If anything, actually, I hope that that lesson is super helpful for you. If you're experimenting on your own that um, you can just really quickly jump in, select any particular element that you maybe want to mess with tweaking. Um, you can use this MDM page. And you might say something like, hmm, I want to, uh, I want to change like the background color or I want to change like maybe the, um, I don't know, like I want to add a border um, or I want to maybe separate these two elements a little bit more. Um, and, and in fact, I guess I'm kind of jumping the gun. You don't even have to go directly to maybe your documentation resource that you have handy because of this layout. Um, model here that you have like very immediately you can just start tweaking these things and it will show you exactly the css that it used to make that modification uh, right there so that is really really cool um and just to show you by the way how i would do that increase i would use margin here because it's not going to change my containing it's not going to change my content but it'll change the space around my content um, so anyway, uh, I definitely wanted to cover a little bit more, but hopefully next week we can jump to um, some more um, stuff about, I think I wanted to get to um, 
yeah, maybe some alternative box sizing um, uh, approaches that people sometimes use that look a little bit different from this, but it lets you lay out your page in unique or more dynamic ways. And it helps solve that problem of the, uh, the way that these boxes change when you change the, um, the size of your browser. Well, does anybody have any questions there are about anything? It doesn't have to be about CSS or anything we covered. It could be about anything before we wrap up. No questions from me guys, but man, this was good. I loved the resources at the beginning. I'm definitely going to check them out. Yeah, um, I will, I, I kind of struggle sometimes to keep those up to date, but I will definitely do that um, more uh, regularly. Um, I basically try to include all the ones that I usually address like in a session. Um, so I definitely do go back and watch those and try to pull those in. I will definitely add the editors um because that should get you pretty far if you're just getting started and um uh yeah i'll definitely add this link as well because it gets into a bunch of different aspects we didn't even talk about position which is another big property in building um your layout on a page like where the like the xy coordinates of a block basically um so maybe that's something we'll talk about next time but